From the days of the Penny Arcades in the early 1900s to the Pac-Man Fever days of the 80s and beyond, arcades have been a destination for many to socialize and play games for fun or to compete for the highest score. And though Nintendo is way better known for their home console and handheld game experiences, they too did, and still do, dabble in the arcade game market. So in this video, we'll take a look at Nintendo's history with arcade machines and have a look at some of the best and weirdest they have been involved with. Now, I won't be going over every single Nintendo arcade product. Sorry, Kirby of the Stars, Magical Tower of Metal Land. But I'll try my best to cover the ones that I think are most notable in Nintendo's history or just most noteworthy in general. So with that, let's take things way back to almost half a century ago. The year is 1973. The United States has ended involvement in the Vietnam War, and hey, would you look at that, Nintendo also took their first foray not only into the arcade game market, but also into the video game market as a whole. This first endeavor was the Nintendo Laser Clay Shooting System. As far as I'm aware, and as the name implies, this was a pretty basic skeet shooting style game where the player would pay 100 yen to shoot a light gun at a printed or painted screen where moving targets would be displayed by an overhead projector. The idea was spearheaded by then president of Nintendo Hiroshi Amauchi and Gunpei Yokoi, who was of course also famous for contributing to the creation of the Game Boy. Their plan was to install these laser clay shooting systems in former bowling alleys, which were getting shut down due to dropping interest in the game among the Japanese. These systems were pretty successful in their first few weeks at several test locations, and the factories producing new ones were at full capacity. For Nintendo, things were looking bright. Then came the 1973 oil crisis. And due to the rising cost of oil, production of these systems halted, and Nintendo found itself in serious debt. However, the game still continued to be somewhat popular in Japan, and later a smaller, cheaper iteration for arcades started development called the Mini Laser Clay. And that would eventually come to be released as Wild Gunman in 1974. There was also an adult version of Wild Gunman that was being developed known as Fascination, where the gameplay was the same, but instead of featuring cowboys, it featured a Swedish woman in a dress, and the player's goal was to shoot her clothes off until she was fully nude? Yeah, needless to say, this version was never made available to the general public. How's that for a lost bit? In later years, several other shooting games were developed and released for this mini laser clay system, and they started attracting international attention. These games include Shooting Trainer, New Shooting Trainer, Skyhawk, Battle Shark, and although unconfirmed, some even say an early version of Duck Hunt was made for this system. Obviously, Nintendo later revisited the idea of using light guns with the release of the NES Zapper and games like Duck Hunt almost a decade later. Now, before we get too far ahead of ourselves, rewinding back to 1975, Nintendo developed and released the EVR race game. Although the laser clay shooting system was developed and released prior, Nintendo regards the EVR race as the first game they released for some reason. This large game could be played by up to six players and was essentially a horse racing simulator. Each player would predict which horse would win and would be able to watch a race on a screen. Apparently this game was very complicated not only to play, but also to maintain as these machines were notorious for breaking down. Then in the later half of the 1970s, Nintendo released quite a few new arcade games. On one hand, there were some original games, such as Test Driver, a driving simulator in which the only goal was to not crash, Computer Othello, a tabletop arcade version of the Othello board game, and Sheriff, a game actually designed by the legendary Shigeru Miyamoto in which the player would have to save a woman by shooting some bandits that surround the player. You may actually remember this Sheriff, as he makes an appearance as an assist trophy in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Anyway, on the other side of the coin, Nintendo also released several knockoff or licensed clone versions of other games. There were the games Block Fever and Monkey Magic, which were clones of Breakout, Space Fever and SF High Splitter, which were obvious knockoffs of Space Invaders, and then there was Head on N, which was a licensed Nintendo release of a Pac-Man clone made by Sega. 
And finally, Bomb BN, which was another licensed clone of Namco's Bomb B, which itself was another sort of breakout clone. Yeah, I'm losing track of who's making knockoff versions of whose games too. It's honestly kind of funny to think that a company that now takes so strictly to emulation, fan remakes, and has its games illegally bootlegged onto millions of cheap Famiclone systems, at one point too was developing knockoff versions of other games. There was also Space Launcher, which although it played very similar to Frogger and could be seen as a clone, Space Launcher actually released two years before Frogger, making it the true original. The game was set in space, and the player would have to dodge objects and enemy alien fire to reach some sort of treasure. And although the gameplay was original at the time, it appears that the game cabinet and promotional artwork was, uh, heavily inspired by a certain movie about a war in the stars that may have been really popular when this game was made. Hmm. Interestingly, although there was a big focus on computerized arcade games at the time, Nintendo was also developing some more mechanical-based arcade games too. First, there was Deadline and Fancy Ball, which were basically, I guess, just pachinko-style games in which marbles were to fall into certain slots to reward the player with a prize. Then, and I think more interesting, was Smash Matic. And this badminton game was essentially a mechanical arcade version of Pong, in which the players would use a button and lever to move their paddle and try to get a ball past their opponent's paddle. This honestly sounds really cool, and I'm very interested in exactly how the mechanical parts of this system worked for this game. Now moving on to the early 80s, Nintendo started off the decade with releasing Helifire, Space Firebird, and Radar Scope the latter of which had released in Japan a year prior in 1979. Space Firebird was a rather basic space shooter where the player had to take on swarms of enemy Firebird enemies, Helifire, which had the player commandeering a submarine under enemy fire, and Radar Scope, which was a game similar, I guess, in style to Galaga. These games were quite successful in Japan, and this was around the time a new division of Nintendo was created. Perhaps you've heard of it. Nintendo of America. Then president of Nintendo of America, Minoru Arakawa, saw the success of Radar Scope and Space Firebird in Japan, and as a result ordered a large shipment of these two games to be brought over to the United States in the hopes of recreating that success in a brand new market. However, due to a delay in both manufacturing and shipping the game to New York, the small window of opportunity Nintendo had to ride the hype of these games was seemingly lost. And although apparently Space Firebird saw some success in the States, Radar Scope did less than stellar to say the least. As a result, Nintendo was left with thousands of under or unplayed arcade units, many of which were apparently just collecting dust in a warehouse. But, instead of just banishing them to the arcade machine graveyard, Nintendo figured it would make much more sense to try and salvage what they could with these games by converting them. At first, Shigeru Miyamoto was tasked to essentially just remake Radar Scope with a few new features, an early form of an expansion pass, if you will. But instead, Miyamoto took a chance, one that would change the face of Nintendo forever. And instead of just updating Radar Scope, Miyamoto created an entirely new game, breaking the mold of the tons of space shooter games that were being pumped out at the time. A game with a gorilla, a damsel in distress, and a jumping man. That's right, this was the birth of the arcade classic Donkey Kong, and this new game genre took the world by storm, and all those radar scope machines were quickly converted into Donkey Kong. As you all probably know, Donkey Kong quickly became an arcade staple and is often considered not only the most important arcade machine to be released in the 80s, but also one of the most important games ever released by Nintendo, as it essentially propelled the company into the mainstream. Like honestly, who knows what might have happened to Nintendo had Donkey Kong not been created. Then, much like any other form of media that becomes a hit, only about a year after Donkey Kong was released, a sequel was needed. And as such came Donkey Kong Jr., in which the tables have turned and now Jumpman is the antagonist and you play as Jr. to rescue Donkey Kong. There were also a few other games that came out around this time that weren't quite as successful. 
There was Sky Skipper, where you take control of a plane to search for various animals, as well as the kingdom's king and queen, all while avoiding and dropping bombs on gorillas. Then there was the Japanese exclusive Space Demon, a spiritual successor to Space Firebird, which, you guessed it, is another pretty unoriginal space shooter. Let's get back to DK though. Apparently when developing Donkey Kong, Shigeru Miyamoto really wanted the game to feature characters from Popeye. Yeah, that Popeye. Since Nintendo wasn't as well known of a company prior to the release of Donkey Kong, they weren't given the license to use Popeye assets, and I suppose, thankfully so. However, after the success of Donkey Kong, Nintendo was indeed given the license to use the Popeye IP, and in 1982, a Popeye arcade game was made. This game had the player collecting items being dropped by olive oil in various different locales, while of course also avoiding various hazards. 1983 came around, and Japan saw the release of Nintendo's first major home console, the Famicom, which aimed to bring players the arcade experience of games like Donkey Kong right into their living rooms. It was also around this time where it seems Nintendo started to divert more and more resources into this home console venture. Regardless, Nintendo needed another big hit to keep their momentum from Donkey Kong going. And they certainly got it, with a game about two plumber brothers. Mario Brothers is considered to be a sequel to Donkey Kong, even though many changes are evident. No more falling damage, no Donkey Kong, and of course multiplayer was brought into the game, which made it even more intriguing for those who wanted to play a game either cooperatively or competitively. But despite all of this, the arcade version of Mario Brothers was considered only mildly successful, probably largely in part due to the US video game market all but collapsing in 1983. Nintendo ended off 1983 with two more pretty successful arcade releases, Donkey Kong 3, as well as the original Punch-Out, which went on to spawn some sequels. Super Punch-Out in 1984, a spin-off arcade title called Arm Wrestling in 1985, as well, of course, the incredibly popular home console releases, Mike Tyson's Punch-Out for the NES and Super Punch-Out for the Super Nintendo. Arm Wrestling is considered to be the last proprietary original arcade game to be solely developed by Nintendo. But that said, this isn't even close to being the end of Nintendo's adventure in the arcade game industry. Starting in 1984, Nintendo began releasing their Versus series of arcade games, and these were essentially arcade ports of Famicom or NES games, with the big gimmick of featuring a two-player experience at the arcade. These Versus series arcade games were being made and released from 1984 all the way to 1990, and featured several Nintendo games that are now considered classics, such as Duck Hunt, Dr. Mario Balloon Fight, Excite Bike, Super Mario Brothers, and of course, who could forget, Mahjong. Then, around the time of the release of the Super Mario Bros. Mushroom World pinball game, in 1992, Nintendo announced it was basically the end of developing their own arcade games in-house, and this turned out to be a departure from the arcade game business for quite some time. There were a few bizarre, or I guess more experimental, Mario arcade games, if you want to even call them that, released only in Japan in the years that followed such as Mario Undokai, or Mario Sports Festival, which was a Dance Dance Revolution-style game, Boo Boo Mario, which was one of those ride things you see at the mall for kids and kids at heart alike, and also Mario Roulette. The latter was a quite rare game based mostly on Super Mario World, and despite the name, it doesn't really play like a typical game of Casino Roulette at all, but rather more like a slot machine. Instead of having a traditional roulette wheel, the player just has to stop the spinning and cycling tiles, and then stop one tile in the middle to try and form a line of like items. Like I said, kind of like a slot machine. Then, getting back to more traditional arcade games, in 1994, Nintendo assisted Midway with co-developing several racing games. Cruisin' USA in 1994, Cruisin' World in 1996, and Cruisin' Exotica in 1999. If you've been to an arcade at any point in the mid-90s to the mid-2000s, chances are high that you probably saw these games there. There's also Cruisin' Blast, which was released more recently in 2017, but as far as I understand it, it was mostly developed by company Raw Thrills, and it was only licensed by Nintendo. 
Thankfully, Nintendo's arcade journey doesn't end with some racing games, as in 2003, although not necessarily developed strictly by Nintendo, several arcade game experiences featuring Nintendo IPs started being released. The first of these third-party Nintendo arcade games came in the form of F-Zero AX, a beautiful complement to F-Zero GX that made anyone that played it their heart out. Just like F-Zero GX, AX was developed entirely by Sega-owned company Amusement Vision, who also developed Super Monkey Ball 1 and 2 for the GameCube. F-Zero AX in particular is really rare in North America, with only 20-ish reportedly existing in the continent. I'd love to track one of these down and play it someday, so if you know where one of them is located, let me know. Then, starting in 2004, several Japan-exclusive Mario Party games were made. First was Mario Party Fushigi no Koro Koro Party, which roughly translates to Super Mario Rolling Party of Mystery. This game was specifically themed around Mario Party 5, and was actually developed by Capcom. A direct sequel also made its way into Japanese arcades in 2005. A few years later, more Mario Party themed games were released in Japan, like Mario Party Koro Koro Carnival, and Mario Party Fushigi no Koro Koro Catcher 1 and 2, which were all based around Mario Party 8 this time. These weren't just your run-of-the-mill arcade games like a coin slider or a claw game, but rather a big, flashy combination of several types of those style of games that also provided a pretty interesting Mario Party minigame experience. Well, at least as much as you can in an arcade form like this. There's a really informative video by Japan My Way that explains one of these games in more detail. I'll link it in the description if you'd like to check it out. While on the topic of Mario Party games, there's also Mario Party Challenge World, which was released in Japan in 2016, and a test version found its way to America in 2017. This Mario Party 9-inspired game was much more of a roulette experience than the Mario Roulette game I mentioned earlier. Here, a ball would roll around the screen for some more traditional roulette stuff, but it also had some really cool minigames like a battle with Bowser. This honestly looks like a blast to play, but unfortunately it seems the American version of this game never released. I recently made a video going a bit more in depth with this game, so if you're interested to see what happened to it and where it ended up, be sure to check it out by clicking or tapping on the card in the top right of this video right here. Then there's also New Super Mario Bros. Wii Coin World, which too was never released outside of Japan. It was basically a slot machine, and just like the previous game was basically a roulette game, I'm sure the reason both of these weren't localized stateside is that they're considered too casino-like for a Western audience. If there's a way to make money, you bet Pokemon's gonna find its way there. Moving on to the Pokemon side of things, I was not surprised that there were a few Pokemon arcade games made as well. There are, of course, more of the same arcade experience that we've already discussed, like Pokemon Metal World, which is another coin pusher game, and Pokemon Catch, which looks to be more of a pachinko-style game. Then there's also some different stuff, like Dance Pikachu, a rhythm-style game with a large Pika boy, Pikachu's Great Surfing Adventure, which has the player controlling Pikachu on a Lapras with a steering wheel, yeah, I don't know, a Pokemon drawing arcade game, and more. There are also a few more Pokemon arcade games that had a bit more to them than Tan's Pikachu. There's Pokemon Batrio and Pokemon Treta, which had a focus on Pokemon battling akin to something like Pokemon Stadium. Then there is Pokemon Ga Ole, which also focused on Pokemon battling, but also featured a massive screen, and it used these disc things. And of course, there is Pokken Tournament, the Tekken-style Pokemon game that, as you probably know, got ported over to the Wii U and then to the Switch. Unfortunately, aside from Pokken Tournament, I believe the rest of these are only available in Japan. Honestly, there are quite a few really interesting Pokemon arcade games out there, and I'd love to get into more details with the ones I mentioned. Maybe someday I'll make a dedicated video on them or something. And lastly, let's wrap things up by going back to some more arcade games featuring the Mushroom Kingdom's finest. Not too long after the release and success of Mario Kart Double Dash, 2005 saw the release of Mario Kart Arcade GP. 
This game ran on a modified version of the Double Dash engine and featured familiar faces in the series as well as some new ones like Pac-Man. Mario Kart Arcade GP also packed a whopping 93 items. 93 items, that's insane. And 72 of those were brand new to the series. This game went on to spawn a sequel with a creative title, Mario Kart Arcade GP 2. This game featured more characters like Waluigi, a Tamagotchi, and even more new items. Next came Mario Kart Arcade GP DX, and this is the only game in the entire video so far that I think I have ever seen in the wild in my life. Though I don't like it nearly as much as a traditional Mario Kart game, the visuals are great, and the wheel vibrates when you drive on rough terrain, which is also pretty neat. Lastly for the Mario Kart arcade games, I guess you could call this an arcade game, is Mario Kart Arcade GP VR, which, as you guessed it, is a VR game. This game is only available in very select areas in the world, and I was fortunate enough to have a chance to play it with some of the other Minus World guys in 2018. It definitely felt like more of a scripted experience rather than a traditional race of Mario Kart. But I can't deny it was an absolute blast to swing a hammer around and physically throw a Koopa shell. I have a very strong feeling this was a beta test of sorts, and this experience will be expanded upon in the years ahead, perhaps in the upcoming Super Nintendo World theme park. Then moving on from Mario Kart, there were also a few Japan-exclusive Donkey Kong arcade games that were sequels to Donkey Kong Jungle Beat. There was Donkey Kong Jungle Fever and Donkey Kong Banana Kingdom. These were, once again, coin pusher games. Man, they must really love their coin pusher games over in Japan. Then there's the Luigi's Mansion arcade game, which thankfully did get a release outside of Japan. This game is more of a rail shooter experience where the player basically takes control of a poltergust and then has to flash and suck in as many ghosts as possible. I haven't had a chance to play this one yet, but I really hope I get to, as I've only heard good things about it. And lastly are the Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games arcade games for the 2016 and 2020 Olympics. The latter is currently unreleased as of the making of this video and is slated for a summer 2020 release. The 2016 version though of course features characters from the Mario and Sonic universes and has the players taking part in various Olympic events by running or jumping in place and or using these two large joystick things. This game features nine Olympic events including archery, a 100 meter dash, swimming, hammer throw, and more. I think it's safe to assume the 2020 version will be pretty similar to this one. This is another game I know exists out here in North America, but I just haven't been able to track one down yet. If I ever find it though, I would absolutely love to give it a go. From the humble days of creating knockoff versions of other games, to massive success stories like Donkey Kong, and then to modern arcade hits like Mario Kart Arcade GPDX and beyond, Nintendo has had quite the arcade timeline so far, and I'm excited to see where they go next. There's one thing for certain though, Japan's definitely getting some more Nintendo-themed coin pusher games. And that is my retrospective of sorts of Nintendo's arcade history, and I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to slap a like down below as it really helps me out a lot. Also, be sure to subscribe for future videos, swing by my other social media things which are all linked below, and if you want to support the channel, check out my merch over at tetrabitgaming.com, or consider becoming the latest member of the Bit Club. Click on the join button below for more information. Anyways guys, thanks so much for tuning in, and I will see you in a bit.